So let me move this up a little. Okay. So as I said, intro just we're we're just kind of it's not a stats course. It it's uh, but we're just you know these are topics that you would talk about in a stats course, but in much more depth. And there's more topics that you would cover, obviously. So we're just kind of it's a survey. Um, and so statistics. is the science of collecting, organizing, and interpreting data. All right, um, it's used everywhere. If you do any other science, if, if you decide to become a biologist or something, or like a, maybe not so much physics, a little bit of physics, anything else, so chemist, all, all the sciences use statistics in some way, um, usually depending on the field. Um, political science is like basically applied statistics, but um, it's everywhere. Um, uh, so the blank is the complete set of objects, so the population, Right. And so in general, in statistics, you, you, you want to study something. And in the vast majority of cases that you'll see if you read like a textbook or an art textbook, or if you look at anything online, most statistics applications involve people. But there's nothing that says your population has to be people. It, it could be bacteria or something. I don't, I don't know what exactly you would do for bacteria to survey them, but, but you know, you can most of our things will be people related like voters or like pop pop popular opinion things but like um you know it, it can be anything um right and so as a quick example if you're studying an election what would your voter what would your population be voters yeah it'd just be the voters of the, whatever it could be a local election it can be any election um so voters right it's just going to be the thing you want to study right <laughs> But the word population refers to all of them, right? And that's, so this is in contrast to this next sheet here. And so this is probably one of the more, more important parts. So a sample is a subset of the population. So the population is literally everything. So if your survey or if, you're, if your study was talking about voter, voters in the United States, or like the, the presidential election maybe, then your population would be every single voter in the United States. If it was about a local election, your population would be local voters, every single one of them. Uh, and so obviously there are limitations to what you can do with polls, right? You can't, uh, you can't literally poll every voter. I mean, you could, but that would be the election. Um, and that very black. Um, and so what you have to do is you have to take a sample, a subset, and usually the samples is, is something you construct. And constructing a, a good sample is extremely difficult. Um, and anyway, so uh, as a sample, a blank is when your sample is equal to the population, a census. Right? So basically, you're, you're surveying, you're polling every single person in the population. Polling everyone in the population. So it's a census. It, it's, you can think of it, it's like the census, the United States census. Like they, the idea is to, is to get information from every single person in the country. Um, so they literally have people go to house to house in some cases to find people. Uh, and so that it's, it's a census, it's every single one. They're not taking a sample and extrapolating, they're trying to find everyone, all right? Um, and so what would, could be possible samples if you wanted to study how New York voters or how New Yorkers voted in the 2020 election, right? And there's a billion different samples you could do. And some of them would be bad and some of them would be good, but it's just any subset of the voter, New York voters. So any subset of New York voters. So for instance, you could say like Cat County voters, right? So Cat County voters are a subset of New York state voters and therefore would be a sample. Um, you could even say if you, you could say you your sample would be all New York state voters and that would be considered a census in this case because your population is the same as your sample. Um, you could say maybe you stand outside of reads and you poll people uh, and ask how they voted. So ask people outside uh, of reads. Right? It, it can be anything that you, you construct, all right? And there's, a, and it, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a billion different samples, um, assuming it's a subset of the New York State voters, right? 
All right. Uh, so again, sample and population. Sample is one of the more important topics. Um, the, the data we study from population is called the parameter. Uh, and the blank are the values calculated using data from the sample. So that's uh, the statistics. <coughs> All right, so in this case here, so I guess this corresponds to my example. <coughs> Sorry. Um, in this example that we've been talking about, like New York State voters, our parameter would be how they voted. So the parameter, well, I guess I'll list everything because it says population, sample, parameter. So population, sample, uh, what else do I have? Parameter and statistics. Oops, statistics. There we go. All right, so as we said, if we were studying voters in New York, my population would be every single voter in New York. All right. The sample, the sample you would have to figure, you would have to construct. It could be anything. All right. Let's just say Cat County voters. Let's say Cat County voters um, outside of Reeds. All right. I don't know if that's how you spell reads, but I'm going to go with that. Um, and so the parameter is the, again, it's, it's the data you're studying. So in this case, it would be how they voted. Maybe their, their election preference. I don't know. It can be however you want to say it. It would just be their voting preference. All right. Um, as another example, maybe if you were, if you were polling everyone, if you were standing outside Reed's polling someone or polling people and asking them if they like cats or dogs, the parameter would be like pet type or like you know, cat slash dog. It would just be, it's just whatever the data that you're taking is in kind of a general way, right? And then finally, the statistics are, are just the, it's the numbers that you get. So like, for example, this would be like, um, I don't know, maybe I'll put percentage of people voting one way or another, All right? So for example, I don't know what the popular vote was in the 2020 election, but like maybe it's like 51%, uh, I, it's not this close, Biden versus 49%. Trump, I don't, I don't know what it was. It was more than that. Four, yeah, let's say 54, I don't know, five, six? I don't know, something, make up some percentages, right? And that's, that's what your statistics would be. You could say like, oh, 70% of the people outside Reeds voted for Trump or like 30% of the people outside Reed voted for Biden. It would just be statistics, like data that you've calculated based on the raw numbers that you've pulled, right? Any questions about these definitions? Couldn't the statistics though be like favored for like Allegheny County? Yeah, Most yeah. of Allegheny County is Trump. But like if you yeah. go to like Albany, Albany yeah. is Biden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 very important actually. So uh, when it comes to choosing your sample, it it's gonna be extremely difficult to choose good samples, and that's why actually because depending on who you talk to, you'll get different answers, and it may or may not be representative of the population at large. All right. That's actually a different, that's t and we will talk about that later in 10.3, but that's a good point. Yeah, so it, it will be different. Like this is, this I, the state and national percentages will be vastly different from local percentages. Some, I think there are some counties that voted like 91% or higher in one direction or the other, depending where you are. Some counties are very red, some are very blue. So it just depends. Um, it, as you said, most, most people down here would probably be on the red side. All right. All right, so those definitions are the important part. Population sample, parameter. We don't, we don't use parameters much. Uh, and statistics, obviously, is important because that's what we're talking about. Um, but let's just kind of run through a, a couple mock examples on how you perform kind of very simple studies. Right. So there's some key steps, right? Uh, and we kind of already, maybe you already know these. But state your goals and explicitly state what you want to study. Like in the previous examples that we've done, we've just been talking about voters in New York. So we want to study their, their election preferences. Uh, and then this is, as I said, this is like wildly vital. Choose a sample, right? Um, 
collect your data. This is also very important, but uh, if your sample, if something's wrong with your sample, the rest, it, it's just, you're lost. So uh, collecting the data is important, but it, this is, yeah. Um, infer data about the population. All these steps are really important, especially these are like the core, the core crunch. So like whenever you hear of like a study being wrong or like there being a mistake in X, Y, and Z, it's usually, it's gotta be one of these three kind of things. Like either their sample was bad, they collected their data in a weird way, or they did some kind of analysis with their data that was screwy. So <laughs> these are very easy to mess up. And that's why whenever you hear like in political science and like all these pop study kind of things, you'll hear like, oh, you hope one study will say one thing and another study will say another thing. Like if you look at um, cohabitation relation with um, like divorce, like if you look at, if you try to find a relationship between couples who cohabitate before marriage and then get divorced, you'll have a bunch of studies on one side and then you can find studies using exactly the same data on exactly the opposite side. Like they'll come to opposite conclusions using the same data bank even. So <laughs> it's amazing how difficult inferring data about populations from a sample is. All, right, all this is very difficult and there's not even a right or wrong way to do it sometimes. Like sometimes you can do everything right and still have a wrong answer. Um, so in this example, how can we conduct a study to determine how New York State voters voted, right? Um, and we'll just go on with what we were doing, right? And so uh, let's just state. So we'll kind of walk through these numbers one by one. So number one, state your goals. We want to study New York State voters. All right, that's my goal. Two, the sample. And again, the sample I chose earlier was horrible. Like the people outside Reeds or Walmart or something in Cat County are going to be vastly different uh, as stated from people in like Albany or like if we even go out of state, like somewhere like another count, uh, you know, downstate or something like that, New Jersey, it's gonna be very different. So um, the sample will be important, but for our purposes in this kind of naive study, we will say uh, people, uh, we will switch it up, people outside Walmart, who will talk to us. All right, and there's actually, and this is another interesting point too, like, so suppose you stand outside Walmart and try to poll people. Not only are the people outside Walmart going to be going to be different, like that sample is going to sway your results one way or another, but the people who will talk to you are going to be different than the people who won't talk to you, right? So like you might, the people who are willing to talk to a stranger outside Walmart are, might have a different uh, uh, life, life view um, than people who, who don't want to talk to strangers outside Walmart. So you're going to get different opinion. You're going to get a different result just by who and how you ask a question. Um, and yeah, so that was your sample. Uh, three is collect data, and we can just ask, just ask, just ask who they voted for. Right. Um, asking questions is a whole other topic in statistics as well it's very difficult to ask good questions and, and this there's a lot of detail that we're not going to get into but you know there, there's an example where a pew research center asked a question it was back in the early 2000s about the iraq war and it was like would you favor it, they asked two the same question two ways they asked it once and it is this is going to sound obvious once you hear the results but they asked would you favor uh, military intervention in iraq uh, and then the second one they asked, they asked, would you favor military intervention in Iraq? But they said, even if there were uh, US casualties. So like that extra chain at the end saying that there could be uh, Americans dying over this invasion uh, made people <laughs> favor it less, obviously. So like you can have a poll, you could choose a sample really well, and, and you might ask a question in a sort of biased way where you're making people feel like they should answer it towards one direction or another. So asking questions in a very uh, kind of flat way is difficult as well. I'll, and this one is not so bad because it's kind of a binary answer. It's yes or no, who'd you vote for? Um, anyway, uh, four, infer data. So for four, the data that we're talking about is just percentages probably. So we would just compute, just compute percentage of Trump versus Biden voters All right ideally we want a percentage it you could really compute anything though All right and then five draw conclusions so uh who you would say who did cat county voters favor 
Great. And yeah, so you will get an answer, right? Your, your sample will be suggestive of something. It might not be correct, but it will suggest something. Right. Uh, and so and these are, again, kind of steps you might find obvious, but there's a lot of nuance to all of them, some more than others. All right, um, let's see. Maybe we'll just do one more. I have two here, but um, we'll do this one. Okay. So suppose in this case, we're getting away from voting. As I said, most examples that we'll do are just involve people because it's the easiest thing to think about, but there's no need for that. Um, in this case, it's more people. So we want to study the average amount of money a first year undergraduate spends on textbooks. How might we perform this study? Uh, any ideas? So I guess I should say one, we already know what one is, right? We want to study, we want to find how much money. Find average Oops. money All right. on textbooks. All right, two. All right, so the interesting part is the sample. How can we construct a sample? of college students. Like we could do the same thing we were doing, right? We could stand around, JC, assuming it's not COVID, we could stand around JCC's campus uh, in Olean or wherever you are, and uh, we could just ask people. So you could just ask people. The other way you could do it though, that's a little more interesting, is you could, you could go and maybe you have the support of like administration or something, and then they give you a list of classes. What you could do is you could choose random classes to go into and pull the classes. So that's the one I'll, I'll list because it's just a little different than the random kind of sampling we were talking about. So you could just pull, so, um, so get list of classes, um, choose uh, a random number. Oops, can't write today. Random number. Right, so we get the list like you have in front of you and you just pick, you just pick a random number, like maybe five, five classes, all right, uh, of them. And pull everyone in those classes. All right, sorry, it's a little scribbly. I don't know why I'm so scribbly today. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea. You just take a list of the classes going on on campus. You take, you find, you, you choose randomly a few of them, like five maybe, and you just go into each of those five classes and you pull everyone in those classes. Um, and this is, it's pretty random, right? It's not too bad. You would expect to get a, a decent variance among uh, the students because you have to be careful, especially at a place like JCC, because some classes will have different kinds of students than others. Like, uh, I don't know the demographics exactly, but I would imagine that if you go into like a, you know, like a gen ed, like this class is a gen ed class, but I guess there's good variance people. I don't know. I was just thinking like maybe nursing will have a different, like if you go into a nursing class, students in there might be uh, different than if you go into a normal like English one class or something uh, where you have a lot of maybe just freshmen starting off. Um, so you have upper graduate or uh, underclassmen and upperclassmen and uh, you know, there's a lot of different variation. And so if you don't choose your classes kind of carefully, you might get a bunch of freshmen. Um, I guess this is all about freshmen, but you kind of understand, right? Different programs have different textbook costs. Uh, there's a whole different variation. So you just want to choose classes randomly for that reason. All right. Uh, three, collect data. Maybe you have a form, maybe hand out a form. in each class. Right. Um, and yeah, and then there, there you go. So four, right? So you could have a form, you could just ask them and collect data. You can, maybe you have like a sheet, like a, like a big table and you fill it out. Um, all right, infer data. So to infer the data, you, you could just average, average the prices, everyone pays. Right. So you just ask on this form, how much do you estimate you paid this year or this semester or whatever you're studying exactly uh, in textbooks? And they would write it down. And then you, at the end, once you have all this data, you'd average it together. That would be it. And then five, I don't know what your conclusion to be. You'd have an average. I don't know. You'd have an average. So I'll leave that blank. <laughs> all right. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, this kind of question is very loose. And so I think on the test last year or last semester, I, I put a question like this. So you know, when, when you're doing homework or a test or a, this project or whatever, some of these questions don't really have answers that are concrete. Like this, you could have put a very different answer and still been perfectly correct. 
Um, especially now, we haven't talked much about sampling bias, but any questions so far? Alrighty, so oh, let's just do these two quick questions and then we'll move on. So determine the, these are unrelated. <laughs> so determine the, I just thought they were kind of cute. Determine the average length of trout in a lake. Researchers catch 20 fish and measure them. What is the sample and what is the population? Anyone? So would the sample be the fish? Yeah, like, the, fish they, the fish they caught. Yeah, and then the population would be how many fish they caught in total? Or would that be like if they can find the average fish? The population would be every fish in the, what is it, a lake? In the lake. But how do you know how much fish is in the lake? Oh, you don't. Like, so the population will just be like the, theoretically what you're studying in general. Like if you want to study, if you want to find the average length of the fish in the lake, then your population is every fish in the lake. Like it's kind of like the ideal thing. Like I, so like if you actually wanted the average length, right, what you'd have to do is you'd have to catch every single fish in the lake, right, and average their lengths and you'd have an exact number. And so the population is kind of everything that you're studying. So if, I, if, if I'm talking about fish and lake, it's every fish. If I'm talking about voters in a, a national election, it's every voter in the nation. It's just every, it doesn't mean that you can actually do it. It's just like, theoretically, what would it be? The, um, that, that's kind of why the sample is so important because the sample is, is really you saying, well, this is the best I can do. <laughs> I can't catch every fish in the lake, but I, I can catch 20 of them and measure those. And perhaps that's a representative sample of the population in general. Now it probably won't be, right? I don't know. I don't know anything about fishing, but I, I, I would guess that fish, I don't know, bigger fish are harder to catch just naively. That might not be true. Um, so maybe you catch 20 fish and they're all really small and you conclude that the this lake really has small fish, but that's not necessarily true. It's just your samples screw it up, right? So again, population, everything that you're theoretically studying, sample what you actually are studying. Right? Uh, and a college reports the average age of their students is 28 years old. Is this a statistic or a parameter? What do we think? A parameter. Mm -hmm. No, it's a statistic. The, the statistic, so it's the average age of the students. So to, to get this, this number. Oh, they, so would the parameter be like how many students there are? It would be the age of the students, yeah. So the parameter, the parameter is like the generic, like the, it's just, it's a label of what you're studying. So it's like, so age of students and the statistics or statistic in this case, is the average age of students. So the parameter would be like, the, the youngest student is say 17 years old and the oldest student is say 42. Yeah. So that would be the parameter, and but the average is 28. Yeah, the average, yeah, exactly. The average is what you, the, or the statistic is what you compute from the data you have. So your data in that case is going to be all of their ages. Um, and then you compute the statistics from that data. Yeah. And again, the parameter is just like, it's just what you're studying. It's not, it's not necessarily, it's not the data. It's just, a, you're labeling what you're studying. So like if in this example up here with the fish, my perimeter or my, my para parameter, sorry, my parameter would be the length of trout. And my statistic would be the average length of the trout. So like I'm using my data that I've collected about the length of the trout in order to compute this statistic. Okay. And again, the parameter is just the name of what you're studying. It doesn't necessarily have data attached to it. All right. Any other questions about these? So again, the, the statistics is kind of weird because like in the rest of this course, what we've been doing is really more algebraic math. Like it's, um, it's like, you know, you're adding, you're doing like fun functions, like we were doing the savings plan formula. It's just, it's just an algebraic function, but statistics is, is very much less algebraic.
algebraic like functions and it's more just it's very wordy and it's not it's definition heavy so um the, one of the things you, you, to learn is really more definitions than computations and examples here mm. all right um anyway so sampling methods we've already touched on this a bit um but a blank is one in which each member of the population has an equal pro probability of being chosen. So this is a random sample. Random sample. Right. And so sometimes I should note too, these sampling methods, there's a few of them in here, and uh, uh, sometimes they can bleed together. Like a random sample can kind of be another kind of, like the different methods can kind of be put together in different ways. So. If you're, you know, if you're asked like to list what kind of sampling method this study is, it could be a combination of two or three. It, it, it can be anything. Right. So for example, putting names in a hat and drawing them creates a random sample. You, you just, random, it's just random. There's no rhyme or reason. You have everything, everyone in the population is in the hat <laughs> and uh, you're drawing things at, at willy nilly. Uh, another example, you randomly sample two different groups of a thousand voters in New York. All enough, you get two different answers. Why might this be? And I, we already talked about this too, actually, right? And, and it's just because it's random. It's like you're, you have a thousand people, even I mean, you have more than a thousand, you have a bunch of people here and you take a thousand of them. It, it, it could be if like, if they're all from upstate, there's a decent chance that they're going to be in more red counties. If they're all, if you choose a thousand people and they're all like from Manhattan, there's a better chance that they're going to lean the opposite way. So like, uh, you know, it, the, the, the random voting or the random sample might give you voters that are all one or the other. And, and so it, it just depends. So you, you might get, might get more blue voters. Uh, in one sample and more red in another, right? Because it's just random, like you're just choosing people, right? Any questions with that? Okay, all right. Uh, so that's a random sample, and it's probably the easiest way to compute a sample. You just use to a random. Um, all right. Uh, so this is in stratified sampling. So in stratified sampling, uh, this is going to fix the issue we had in the previous example. A population is divided into subgroups. So in the case of that previous example, we had voters. What you could do is you could take all of the Democrats in New York and all the Republicans in New York and put them in two groups. And then you could randomly choose people from each group and in this case, you would know what percentage of each um, the state consists of, right? So, you know, I don't know what the statistics are for New York State, but suppose it's like, I don't know, 65% Democrat and 35% Republican. So what you would do is you would choose 350 people from the Republican side and you would choose 650 people randomly from the Democrat side. And then you would have a more, uh, it would be more of a consistent sample. Like if you did it that way, it's less likely that your results, should you take different samples of a thousand people would differ, right? Because you're choosing them from these two groups um, that, that really show their voting preferences right away. Right. All right. Uh, anyway, so uh, I just said this here. So suppose um, New York, is 65% Democrat and 35% Republican. So what you do is you, you want a thousand voters. So if you want a thousand voters in your sample, you'd pull, so as I said, you, you, have a, you want a thousand voters so if I wanted 65% Democrat, I would pull 650 Democrats. And 350 Republicans. 
right? And this would be my sample. My sample. Right. Um, so you can really only do this type of sampling when you know a lot about the population, right? Like I, the fact that we know what percentage of New York State is Democrat, what percentage is Republican, is is because everyone is kind of like a registered voter generally, and they you you always you generally register for whatever party you vote for, and so you know the, these this data is known, and so in that case you could do something like this, but in a lot of cases I don't know what how my data looks exactly, like I don't know what kind of strata or subgroups I could or should break it into. So sometimes this isn't really feasible. And even when it is, it, I don't know, it, it's just, it's, you need to know a lot about what your, your sample looks like in order to do stratified sampling, just because you have to be able to break it up. And then you have to know what percentage of each um, the population consists of, right? So if I didn't know that 65% was Democrat and 35% was Republican, I couldn't really break it up so that it was reflective of the overall population. So it's a little tricky. Yeah. In this case, it, if I know it's 65% Democrat and 35% Republican, it, it doesn't really make any sense to do this poll because it's going to lean Democrat. So sometimes you know, it's harder to do. But you could use this, for instance, like suppose you had a more nuanced question. Suppose you had a question not like who you're voting for for president, but suppose you had a question like, do you support like legalized marijuana? Then you might have some Republicans join Democrats and you might have some Democrats go the other way even. So you might, in, in topics that are in the middle, and if you want to see how voters overall want to vote, you could do this in that kind of case. You know, maybe like, do you support capital punishment? Questions where there is some kind of mingling in the parties, you might have better success with this kind of sampling. Great. Any questions? All right. So this, this 10 to is kind of just a, a list, a bunch of different kind of sampling techniques. And we'll talk about them more. Uh, as we do more in this chapter, but so I apologize if it seems like a lot of definitions, but that, that's all statistics is the definitions. <laughs> all right. All right. So in cluster sampling, the population is divided into subgroups, um, and you just take a selection of those subgroups. So it might seem like stratified sampling because we're doing things with subgroups. But it's different in the sense that I'm not using these subgroups to represent the population. Like, like in this case here, I had two subgroups, Democrats, Republic, Republicans, and I knew exactly what percentage of the population each was. And so I was using these two subgroups to kind of balance my sample, to choose my sample so that it represented the overall population. Here, I'm just breaking it into subgroups and randomly choosing them. So <laughs> this is kind of like what we're doing with the, that one example where we're talking about classes. I, I would chose random classes, I went into them, and I used those random classes uh, as, as my sample to be representative of the population of students at large. So it's the same kind of thing here. I'm just kind of breaking them into groups and then choosing randomly. It's kind of like random sampling. I guess you could consider it a kind of a type of random sampling. But uh, anyway. so in this case here, uh, as I said, they're kind of fuzzy. Uh, you want to pull a certain number of college students on campus and determine what their favorite band is. So how might you use cluster sampling here? Right. And this is, this is uh, that class example I did earlier was another example of cluster sampling. And so what you're going to do is, and there are other ways, I guess, different clusters you could break them into. Any subgroups would work. So, you know, the naive way. So the, the way that I, I had intended would be you choose random classes to pull, right? Like, like classes, like on campus. So like um, maybe you should go into like a calculus class and then you go into like an English class and you go um, and pull each of them and you choose them randomly. Um, and so the classes are the, uh, the clusters in this example. But there's other ones you could do, right? Maybe, um, Maybe maybe your your school has a ton of sports teams, and you randomly choose a few sports teams to pull. Um, you know, choose choose random sports teams to pull. All right. Or maybe you choose random clubs. Maybe like 
if your school has a lot of clubs, I'm thinking of UB, they had like a billion clubs. Um, she was, random clubs, tuple, all right. So any subgroups are fine, are technically a cluster sample. And you're just taking those subgroups and you're pulling them randomly. You'll note here, again, in contrast to stratified sampling, we're not doing anything with like percentages or funky like that. We're just kind of saying, oh, we're, we're breaking up our population into some, some small groups and we're just choosing random groups. You might want to be more strategic with your groups though, right? Like if you choose um, random clubs, like if one of your clubs is like a classical music club and a jazz club, <laughs> You're gonna, you're not gonna get results, right? Because not many people like jazz. I mean, people love jazz, but like, you know, population at large won't like jazz as much as the jazz club likes jazz. Um, and and same thing with like sports teams. Like you're some sports teams. If you choose all sports teams, you're only gonna get ath athletes, right? And I don't know what kind of music athletes generally like, but I feel like it might be different than the population at large. You you don't know. And the same all thing. Right. Like, yeah. I have a plot twist in your plan. Yeah. What if it's a school of music? That, yeah, that's a tricky one. Well, then, then, then you might even have subgroups there, though. Like, what if you have a bunch of like people who want to train classically and they love like Beethoven, and then you have a bunch of people who are into like I don't know pop music and they're like mixing oh. music. So you do have different subgroups even there, but yeah, it's that's going to be a weird example. If you choose, if you if your school is a music school and you want to pull them on music, you're not going to get something representative of the population at large like on a national level, but yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so you, it, there's a lot of thought to go into choosing samples. Um, actually, I might finish these notes, how exciting. All right. All right, and this last, oh, there's two more, but these are small sampling types and we'll get into sampling bias, which is more interesting. Um, we've been talking about the whole class though. Uh, blah, uh, so sim systematic sampling, systematic. Sampling. Right. So every nth member is chosen. And again, like if you're inside, if you're like a greeter at Reeds or something, or Walmart, I think they have greeters. If you're a greeter at Walmart and your manager says, uh, taught, you have to say hi to every 10th person, that's systematic sampling. Although you're not asking the question, but you know, the same kind of thing. Um, so, oh, here we are. It, taught every 10th person, systematic sampling. Right. So you just, doing things on a schedule like every 10th person maybe every half hour you pull a person um i mean it does the, in the definition i say every nth member but it, it just has to be regimented in some way like it has to be like bam 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 and without interruption right it's like every 10th person every fifth person every half hour you and you talk to a person kind of thing um you have a phone book in front of you uh construct a sample of people from the phone book using systematic sampling how, how can we construct, construct a sample? And the population here, we want to study everyone in the phone book. So we want a sample of everyone in the phone book. What can we do? If, could you just randomly pick a number? Like open a book and just stick your finger somewhere? No. Uh -huh. So you pick one, right? And then what do you do? How do you pick the next one? Same thing. Well, so if, you, if you just stick your finger somewhere, that's random sampling. We want to do it with systematic sampling. Every like 50th person you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just, you could start with the first person, A, whatever his name is, Alberto Alfonso. And then you go 50 down and then 50 down and 50 down, All right. So choose every, say 50th person, All right? And that's decent, right? It's, it's gonna be fairly random. And if you go through the whole phone book, you'll be good there too. Now, if you didn't go through the whole phone book, like let's suppose you choose a 50th person, but you stop after 200 people, you're, you might be in a pickle, right? Because I don't know, you, you might just have people with names between A and like B. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean there's gonna be any bias there, but it depends what you wanna ask them. I, I, don't, I can't imagine any bias being related to name letters, but there might be. Like maybe, maybe you choose like, well, maybe you're in the Qs for some reason and you just have people with last name Q, you're going to have different, or that start with a Q. It's going to be different than normal population. You know, who, I don't know what kind of names even start with Q. I'm thinking there's this mathematician whose name is Q-I-U and I think he's Chinese. So you might get a lot of Chinese people and depending on the question, it might influence your, your, your sample. So, you know, it could be related. 
anyway. Uh, but there's more, you could do more things like you could choose, I don't know, any number and put that there. But I think you could choose, I think if you chose like one person, the first person in every letter too, that would probably be considered systematic sampling because there's a, there's a scheme, there's a system going on. That's the name. Anyway. All right. Uh, and the last one we're talking about in this little chunk um, is convenience sampling. And we have already mentioned it as well. So convenience sampling is, is like, like the door to door kind of sampling. Like you're going door to door and you can only talk to the people who will talk to you. Oh, that's my example. That will talk to you, right? Like you can't go to someone's door and ask them a question against their will. Like they can just close the door and tell you to go away. And, and so it's a convenient, like there's a convenience to them t actually talking to you. And the same I mean, thing. You could yeah. always hold a gun to their head and make them answer the question. What was that? You could always hold a gun to their head and make them answer their question. Your answer their question. You're not going to get very good, very good question. No, it, it, your sample will be biased. They'll probably say whatever you want. It's not good. Um, and yeah, so, you know, and the same thing if you're like standing on the street and you're asking people questions. People only, I mean, I'm sure there are people who will talk to you on the street randomly, but I feel like only weird people talk to strangers on the street. Maybe not so much here. I don't know, I just, I just can't fathom. I guess it was a, weird, a normal question, but I'm not gonna talk to someone on the street. It, maybe someone else will, but it, you're gonna get a subset of the population that will talk to you randomly on the street. So these kind of things, it's, it's called convenience. Like you're attracting a certain crowd. All right, so questions with any of these uh, definitions? Again, the definitions here are kind of heavy, but it's okay. There's no like algebra, which is nice. All right, and this last part is bi bias and sampling. Um, and so there's this famous example. It was, uh, it's 1936, I don't know, I forgot the details exactly, but 1936, um, and FDR was up for re-election, I think. And there, all these polls, said FDR was gonna win. And there's this one poll by the, I think it was the American Literary Digest. And they said that his competitor, Alf Landon, was gonna win. And it's, if you, any statistics textbook, textbook that you read will have this example in it. It's wildly famous. And, and, and it, it turns out that Alf Landon did not win, obviously. <laughs> but what was amazing was that this, this, this magazine, this literary digest who ran the poll and said he was going to win, had a lot of, a lot of like, support. The, they, I mean, they, they polled, if I remember, 40 million people they polled. Uh, and they had 10 million return their poll. They, they accurately predicted the last They've, they accurately predicted elections before that. Like this isn't like a random podunk kind of operation. It's a real deal. And so the fact that they got it so wrong when everyone else was saying it was like trivial that FDR was obviously going to be up win re-election and they just were like, oh, it's ELF, you know? And, and so that's the thing. They, they, they surveyed so many people, 10 million people, I think it was they surveyed. Like you, it's hard to screw it up when you survey 10 million people, but they still got it wrong. And so people theorize, there's a couple of reasons they think that this American literary, I think it's the Literary Digest, got it wrong, um, was because of bias in their sample. And there, there are two sources of bias. The first was that, so this was 1936, right? And so they got, they got their 40 million names from phone books and, and auto uh, the car records, like car registrations that they were able to get access to. And amongst and their subscribers, so those are the three big groups: car records, phone records, and and their subscribers. And so, in 1936, what happened <laughs> was that people who had phones and cars and magazine subscriptions were a different subset of the population than all the voters. Right? They, they were by and large rich and um, more successful. And and so at this point, people the rich richer people tended to vote for Landon or they wanted to vote for ELF because FDR was more, more uh, kind of a socialist, socialist lean. Uh, and so their sample, their construction, the way where they got their names from that they polled were, was wildly biased. Um, and that was, that was one reason. And the second reason 
people think that this magazine got it so horribly wrong was that they they had convenience they sort of had a convenience sample as well going on. Like they sent out this poll and the people who returned the poll were kind of overwhelmingly Landon supporters because FDR supporters were kind of complacent. They, they didn't, they, they liked him, but they weren't like rabid, like Elf Landon supporters were like rabidly anti-FDR. And so they got, they get a poll for, from this random magazine. Of course they fill it out because they hate FDR. And so you have these two kind of effects kind of, merging together to result in 10 million uh sir poll a huge poll that it was just wrong right anyway the magazine ended up closing because it was such a an embarrassment to them and and yeah and fdr won obviously but it's it's fairly famous and it's kind of amazing anyway um so it's a famous example of bias so if the results of the sample are not representative of the population, so like in the magazine example, the population in this case was every voter in the United States in 1936, and their sample had bias because it had more Landon supporters than it did FDR supporters. And that's not how it was in real life. There were more FDR supporters in real life than there were Landon supporters, but the way they constructed their sample is screwed up. And it's vitally important that we understand bias is systematic. It's not, um, I have an example here that will explain it better, but it's, it's problems in the way that you're constructing your study. It's not like these small variations like in, in the numbers. So like in this example here, um, you have a group of people in a room uh, and you average all of their heights, right? Uh, the average of all their heights is 5.7 feet. So like in this class, for instance, if we measured everyone's height in the class, and average them together, we would find the actual average of our heights. But what you could do as well is you could take a sample and you could average the sample's heights together, right? So suppose there's, I, I don't know any people in this class, um, there's seven uh, on this video right now, <coughs> but suppose we take all, we, we average three of our heights together, all right? So we take a random sample, maybe every other person in the Zoom call, and we average our heights together, and we find it's 5.5. And then we average all seven of our heights together and find it's 5.7. <clears throat> so assuming that the, the sample was kind of taken randomly, in this case, this is not bias, right? Like the numbers are different, but there wasn't any bias. Again, assuming it was a completely random sample, there's no bias. It's, it's, not, it's not systematic. Like you're not, there's nothing inherently wrong with the way you ran it. You just got different numbers because of these slight kind of random variations, all right, that exist. Like not everyone will have the same height. The sample's never going to be perfectly the same. Like the statistics from the sample will never be the same as the population, right? So, so random variations. Not equal bias, all right? So when we talk about bias like this, we're talking about systematic things like like in the in the FDR example, like his the sample was systematically screwed up. They 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 chose like the, the way they got their bat their sample was just incorrect on a fundamental level. It wasn't just random variations, right? Um, and in any case, if you do take more statistics course, this is called systematic. Or um, sorry, uh, wow, not systematic. <laughs> Uh, sampling bias. No, wait a second. It starts with an S, but it's screwing up right now. We don't talk about it in this course. Sample error. Sampling error. All right, sorry about that. Too many S's. <clears throat> in comparison to sampling bias. Um, and so what's interesting about sampling error is that they there's there's a lot of statistics like methods that you can use to kind of eliminate and account for this kind of error so it, it's you can kind of control it and you can put a bound on it and it's not that bad really it will always exist <laughs> thank you for your height destiny um uh, but yeah so you know the the bias is the problematic one you can't control for bias like it's it's going to ruin everything but this kind of random variation where you like heights 
like that, that's just a slight error. And that's something you can account for. Again, we don't get into that. That's more of an advanced. Uh, in a real, in a whole stats course, you would obviously, but not here. All right. Oh my God, well, look at that. We're almost done. All right. And so we're not going to finish 10.3, but we're just starting it. <coughs> I'm sorry. All right. So sampling bias. Um, there's different, different um, ways that that bias can enter your your study, right? And again, we've talked about a few of them kind of implicitly. But the first one we'll talk about is sampling bias. Um, and the technique used to obtain the sample is is bad, right? So basically, here the sample, the way we obtain the sample is incorrect. Like again, in that in the in the FDR example, the the way they constructed their sample from phone book records and car records results in them having more of one person's uh, voter than another, just by the way they made it. Uh, and so their sample is screwy, and that's called sampling bias. Right. So if we were to randomly do public opinion polls using a random telephone survey, who would we potentially be excluding from our survey? Any ideas? So everyone has, what was that? People that don't have phones. Exactly, yeah. People without phones. I mean, and you might say everyone has a phone, but that's not really true. There, I mean, most people have phones, but there's a lot of people who either can't afford it or maybe even, maybe the way we find all these phone numbers, maybe we use a phone book and these are all landlines. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if we're using uh, if we're only calling landlines, we're getting a much smaller part of the population than we would by just dialing random numbers, right? Because only, yeah? Could it also be people that don't answer the phone? Well, that's true too. That, so that would be, um, that, that would kind of, that would be a convenience. We'll talk, that's actually another topic. It's called response bias. We'll talk about that. That's another in this section. I just didn't have these notes. Um, but yeah, that's another problem that could occur. People who answer and talk to you are going to be kind of funky. Well, that, that's not true. But you're going to get a different subset of the population of people who just talk to you randomly. All right. Uh, but yeah, so people without phones, people without landlines. So if we're not um, calling cell phones. Right. And then, and yes, also those two. But yeah, uh, people who actually caught, talk to you or call you back is, is another problem. Okay. Um, this last one. So as a store owner wants to conduct a survey, a survey of his store's customers, his idea is to pull the first 60 customers in a store on a Sunday morning. So the first 60 customers in a store on a Sunday morning. What are the problems with the sample and how can we fix it? So what are the problems first? Is it the first 60, like, so 60 customers, is that like, what, what if my mom and I go to the store, I'm not a customer, but I'm with her. Yeah, so that's true. Are you pulling every single person that walks in? Yeah, so. Everyone a customer? What else? So suppose, suppose the store gets a thousand people a day, right? The first 60 are only going to be in the morning. So you might only get morning people. Might only get old people. If that's the thing. Yeah, morning people might be old people. Morning, old people. You know, suppose, you know, if you like go to Walmart at like 3 a.m. on a Friday night and then go to Walmart at like 6 a.m. on a Monday morning, like there's like almost no crossover in that Venn diagram. <laughs> it, they're just completely diff distant groups. So you know, it, depending on when you talk to people, you, you get different, different results. Um, and then it's on a Sunday too. You won't have church people. Yeah, you'll get people who go to the store on Sunday. So you might not get church people. Maybe. I like the phrase church people, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, you, might get, you might not get church people um, or people who are religious. You might, you might, or you maybe you just people, I don't know, you know, you could have different factors, a lot of factors playing here, right? In any case, these are all good. Uh, how, how can we fix it? Pick a different day at a different time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So pick. Pick a different day. 
slash time and, and, and ask more people. All right, so that's one thing you can do. You can maybe, maybe you ask the first 60 people in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, maybe on like a Sunday and then maybe a Wednesday or something on a Friday, you choose a few different days. The other thing you can do is you could use systematic sampling. Could you just post something on the website? You could post something on the website. That's a good, good question. That also has issues though too, right? Because not everyone will use your website. Not yeah, but everyone... it's like pull people from the store and pull people from the website. Yeah, like... that's a good point. You do a little of both and you get a good representation. Yeah. Yeah, so you know you can you can mix it up. So for the systematic sampling, what you could do too is suppose you get a, a thousand people in a day. Maybe you pull you you pull every tenth person throughout the day, or maybe every twentieth person, or something like that. And it kind of spreads them out. And then you don't have to worry about having just morning people, but you have people throughout the day at every hour. Um, you'd still have the problem with Sunday people, but what can you do? Right, so there's a lot of fixes, but a lot of problems. Right. Um, cool. That's exciting. Yeah, so uh, what day is it today? Tuesday? On Thursday, we'll do talk a lot more about different kinds of bias that we can get in samples. And um, yeah. any questions? All right. So uh, I will see you all Thursday, uh, unless you have uh, questions. Let me see if I can stop this. All right, cool.